about what God is doing at Gray City. Would you agree with me? Can I get somebody to agree with me, man? God is doing amazing things in this church and in this community, man. And I'm so excited to be a part of that, to be here with the family of God, man. I, I wait on you guys all week. I mean, I, I do. I'm like, man, will they hurry up and get here? Well, Sunday, hurry up and get here. Am I the only one that feels that way, man? I'm just ready for Sunday to get here. Amen, amen. Well, in my high school, I'm going to get right into the word. And in my high school days, um, I didn't always go to school here in Columbia County. I spent one year, and I went to Taylor County. Everybody say, boo. And I actually, I, I played basketball. And how many of you, by show of hands, believe that, that this little white preacher could dunk in high school? I couldn't. I was about that far away. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I just, I couldn't. And so, um, but I was good enough to actually want to try out. I wasn't very good at, like, organized ball. But how many of you know street ball is pretty cool because you could just, I mean, there is no fouls. I mean, it's like as aggressively as you can go to the hoop. And so I decided I was going to try out for, for basketball. And in the tryouts, man, was like my claim to, to fame because I knocked down like eight or ten. I mean, it was just crazy. Three-pointers. And I was in the groove. I mean, I, I, it got to the point the first one I hit was by the line. And then the next one, you would have this drill to where you would run. The coach would feed you the ball, and you just hit that jumper. And then you'd run back to the center court line and run back. And it got to the point where I was five or six feet back behind the, behind the line. And it was just douche. Doosh, and they were going, ooh, ooh, I mean, and it just got loud, and they lost their mind in that gym after about the eighth or ninth one, and I was in something that sports people call, they call it the, the, the groove, or, or in the, in the zone, and dude, it felt like the hoop was that, I could just throw it up, and it was going in, and I kind of, you know, they, they lost their mind, and one of my favorite basketball players, and I believe that he is the greatest of all time, and we can agree to disagree. You have every right to be wrong. I give you that right. But how many of you know Michael Jordan just, come on, somebody. That's where he lived. He wasn't just, oh, I, I was in the zone, and then I was. That man, said, that was his life. That's who he was. And so I love LeBron, man. He's awesome. I, I like Kobe, and I like Steph Curry, and, Curry, and, and, and they're good, and they're awesome. But Michael Jordan, in my opinion, now in my opinion, I believe he's the greatest of all time. And I believe this is the 23rd anniversary or the 23rd year that Gatorade come out with a commercial. And I want to I show you that commercial real quick. Go ahead and play that for us. Sometimes I dream that he is me. You got to see that's how I dream to be. I dream I move, I move, I dream I groove like Mike. If I could be like Mike. Oh. That brought back some memories, man. Them were good days when that commercial came out. Amen. But the reality is, is when, when, when this come out, um, it was very, very discouraging to me because it was just a constant reminder that I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be anything like Mike. H how many <laughs> would you agree that I'm not going to dribble like Mike? I'm not going to, I don't want my crossover in like Mike. I'm not going to shoot like Mike. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to, definitely not going to dunk like Mike. So when I see something like this and I see a commercial, it's actually depressing, y'all. How many of you would you agree? It's just a reminder of how much I'm not going to be like Michael Jordan, be like Mike. And I find so often in the church and as a Christian, our call is not only just called to make it to heaven, come on somebody, that we're also called to be like Christ. And maybe you're here today and you look at your life and you look at, at, at 
what you have going on and you kind of do a self-analysis and you're like, Pastor, um, I honestly believe that I could be like uh, like Mike before I could be like Christ. And, and can I tell you today, um, dude, there's no hope for you being like Mike. I'll just say that again. You're, just, you're never going to be like Mike, but you're actually called and equipped to be like Christ. If you don't believe me, if you have your Bibles, go to 1 John 4, 17. And it says this. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness. Everybody say boldness. In the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So in other words, use as he is, so are you in this world. I'm so glad that he put in this world in that text, because some of you would say, yeah, that only applies to the other side of the sweet by and by. That don't apply to the, the, the rough and right now. But can I tell you that God, if you're a believer, he has equipped you to be like Christ. And maybe you're here today and you're like, dude, I just wish, why couldn't we just be like uh, David, like some hero in the Bible? I mean, look at David. Dave, I like David because David was uh, more like me. And maybe you can, can, can relate because David was like, God, you are my watchtower. My refuge. God, you're my fortress. You're my shield and my buckler. Buck, buckler. And that's on Sunday. But you go to Monday and Tuesday and David's like, God, where are you? My enemies are encompassing me. God, I can't find you. And so why couldn't we just be like, like David, you know what I'm saying? As long as things were going good, God, you're my everything. Uh, and, but when it was bad, come on, Monday and Tuesday was pretty bad for me this week. And I was like, God, where are you? You've left me and you've forsaken me. So I get that, that I could identify more with David. How about Peter? Man, that dude cussed and chopped off someone's ear. How many of you can relate? Why couldn't we just be like Peter? How about Thomas? Man, doubting everything. I love Nehemiah. Nehemiah is one of my favorite books. There's a, a lot of leadership uh, qualities and leadership values that you can learn in, in, in uh, the book of Nehemiah. But listen to what chapter 13 and 25 reads. And I can do, I can do this, it says. So I contended with them. In other words, I got into a fight with them. I cursed them. I cussed them. Stuck some of them, struck some of them, and pulled out their hair. How many of you can do that? I could fight with somebody, cuss at them, and, and contend with them, and, and, and pull their hair out. And that joker got a whole book in the Bible. And so when we see our call to Christ, man, how many of you agree I could do what Nehemiah did? Y'all have me choked up here. I've been thinking about this all week. I'm like, I could do what Nehemiah did. I could, I could fight with somebody and pull their hair out, and I could. I could do that. But no, 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 no. Our call is not called to be like one of the people in the Bible, but it's called to be like the God of the Bible. It's called to be like Jesus. And because God has done this amazing gift for you that he's died, he's placed his spirit on the inside of you. How many of you know God would never put a demand on you without supplying the power to accomplish it? I said he'd never put a demand on you and not supply the power to accomplish it. And so we walk around and, 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 and we think that it's more plausible to, to be like Mike and to be like these other biblical characters. But God has an anointing on your life. He's placed the spirit. He's placed the power and the potential on the inside of you. So when I read a, a text like that that says, as he is, so are we in this world. Immediately you're thinking about when you get up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror and say, man. Here's Jesus, and then, like, here's me. And, dude, Jesus is, like, way over here on this scale, on this end, and I'm me. And see, the problem is, is you hadn't identified that you're a three-part being, that you're spirit, soul, and body, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. 
that you are a spirit. See, those that worship God must worship him. Come on, somebody, in spirit and truth, that God is a spirit. And so are you. You're created in the image and the likeness of God. And see, you possess a soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions. And you live in a body, come on, somebody, which is a tent. That's just the earth suit. And so when we depart to be with the Lord, we step out of this earth suit. Is anybody tracking with me? So your spirit, soul, and body. Say it with me. I am a spirit. I possess a soul, and I live in a body. And see, the part of you, if you're born again, that got created in the image and the likeness in Jesus is your spirit man. And this Christian walk is to renew your mind to what it is that God has placed on the inside of you. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, 17 and 18. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. And what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. What God, what Paul is saying under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost is church. I pray that you get an understanding. I pray that the spirit of wisdom and revelation opens your eyes to what it is that God has placed on the inside of you. No more wandering around in darkness. No more wandering around in ignorance. That God has placed some power and potential and himself on the inside of you. Come on, church. We need to open up our eyes and realize what it is that's been placed on the inside of us. Because as we renew our mind, come on, Romans 12.1. As we renew our minds, we start to get an understanding of what it is that God has done for us. And so maybe you're here today and you are a believer and you think, maybe I've got some more of the Holy Ghost in you. But can I tell you, church, that the Holy Ghost don't come in quarts, pints, and gallons. You got it all. So if you got if you got people telling you, well, I got a double anointing of it, that's a lie. You've got the whole thing. The reality is, is you need to renew your mind. Your eyes need to be enlightened to what you have on the inside of you and start releasing the kingdom of God. Start releasing the power of God and stop asking God for a double anointing and realize he put the whole thing in you. Woo, that deserves a better amen than that. So you're called to be like Christ is plausible. And it's expected. But what we got to do is renew our mind to the word of God. Some of you are here today and you're like, man, I want to know the will of God for my life. If I show a hands, how many of you just love to know what the will of God is for your life? Amen. Can I tell you, you can know it? Romans chapter 12, 1 says, therefore, do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the what? The renewing of your mind so that you may know the the good, the acceptable, come on, what's the last one, church? The perfect will of God. So if you want to know the perfect will of God, I would suggest you renew your mind to the degree that you understand what it is that's been placed on the inside of you, that the spirit of wisdom would reveal some truth to you, to what God has done for you. And you're not walking in some half anointing. You're not walking in some pint-sized Holy Ghost filling. You're walking with all of it, and you have the whole thing, and you need to realize that and renew your mind to what is the good, the perfect, the acceptable will of God. Because there's a progression to the degree that you're willing to renew your mind is to the degree that you're willing to operate in the power that's been placed on the inside of you it's not out there it's in the believer it's not that you're asking God to do something for you he's already done it and he's placed it on the inside of you he's not he's not hiding things from you he's hiding things for you I'll say that again he's not hiding anything from you you got it all you've got it all he's not holding anything back But what he needs you to do is release the tap. It's like on a water spigot. The more you renew your mind, the more you open up the vow to let the Holy Ghost flow through you. And so this morning, my heart's cry is that we we take some steps that we can be like Jesus. And and we can walk in an anointing and we can walk in an authority that that God has called the church to walk in. And if you have your Bibles this morning, we'll be in Matthew chapter 14 electronic device you can thumb to it I think we'll put it up on the screen so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through Matthew 14 and we're going to look at some principles I'm going to go back through it and pull out some principles that I believe that if we apply to our lives that we can be more more like Christ 
verse 13, it says, when Jesus heard it, he departed from, from there by boat, and he went to a deserted place by himself. Now, let me just pause right here and kind of set this up, because I kind of just usually read over this um, without really looking at it. And let me just set up the context. Uh, John the Baptist, just a few paragraphs before, has been beheaded. I said he, he's been beheaded. I mean, this is Jesus' cousin. This is his family member. And this man baptized Jesus. So to say that, that John was significant in the life of Jesus is kind of an understatement. That Jesus loved John. And now he's, he's heard this news that his cousin has just had his head cut off. So I love, I love, I love that the fact in Jesus' humanity we can see, you know what, it's, it's okay. We're going to have a bad day, and it's, it's all right to step away from, from some things. And I don't know about you, but I, I've had bad days at work, and I purposely take the long way home. Am, am I the only one? I mean, have, have you seen your kids, like, pr- playing in the, in the front yard, and you just drive by your house, and they're like, there's Dad. <laughs> What's he doing? <laughs> in the hallway home, you're like, God, I hope my kids don't talk to me, and I hope my wife don't say nothing. And it's like, honey, you've been in the bathroom a long time. <laughs> you need some help. And it's like, yeah, bring a tow truck. I'm stuck in here, man. But no, I love that Jesus, even though he's fully God and he's fully man, we can see that it's okay. We're going to have some bad days. And he separated him, himself, and it's all right. But listen to, to what he says. But when the multitudes heard of it, they followed him on foot. From, from the cities and where Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion. Say compassion. And he healed their sick. And I'm going to be honest with you, man. If I just found out one of my loved ones and somebody that I hold dear got their head cut off, man, and I'm trying to get away and like you guys are following me. Can I just go ahead and tell you I'm going to go off on you? I'm just going to be real honest. I mean, y'all pray for me. I'm a work in progress. Don't look at me like uh, I'm on an island here. I mean, I believe that we're all a work in progress progress but just to be you know transparent if I'm out and you know I'm trying to get away and I turn and I'm trying to get away and I turn around I'm gonna say squid leave me alone man (laughs) but no look what Jesus he's moved with compassion and he's motivated by compassion and and when it was evening his disciples came to him saying this is a uh, deserted place and the hour is already late send the multitude away that they may go into the village and by themselves some food now granted they had to he had to be preaching for a long because it's evening at this point and how many of you would would agree if i was to preach a whole series which we're doing next uh, week we're not preaching the whole thing but we're starting relentless and it's gonna be good you need to bring a friend it's gonna be awesome amen but what if i just preached a whole series in, in one afternoon and jesus is is preaching the word and it's gone into evening and and uh, just imagine the boldness by by the disciples at this point to say hey um jesus we need to send them away they're interrupting the son of god preaching god's word and they say hey you need to send them away because really um we're hungry i don't know about you but i can kind of identify with the disciples because have you ever been you know like hangry i don't even know what that word is do you because i get hangry Ask my wife. I mean, I've got to be eating something every two hours, cinnamon toast crunch. I'm talking Oreo cookies do not last. I mean, in my house, it don't matter if they're chocolate or vanilla. I mean, milk don't last in my house. I get hangry. And if you're here today and you don't know what hangry is, that's when you so daggum hungry that you angry. And so I believe that they were hangry. Would you agree with me? You've got to be hangry to interrupt God while he's preaching. Hey, yo, um, they hungry. Y'all, you just need to go on and send them away. No, they're hangry, and they, and, and, and they, need, they need to get something to eat, and we'll continue, continue on. And it says, but Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give. Say that with me. You give. Say it better than that. You give. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have, come on, say it with me, we have, come on, you give, we have, you get, that's a good place to underline something in your Bible. If you're one of them types that do that, that is a great place. We have here only five loaves and two fish. In other words, you have and we give. And see, we, 
look, I believe, as the church at the little that we that we have, and we we think that we can't bring that to to God, and and God's saying, no, I can I can use that. What do you have? I can I can use that. Well, well, Jesus, there's a, a little boy according to John's gospel account of the feeding of of this five thousand that he's got he's got five loaves and two fish. But what are they amongst so many? And he's going, you have. You have, bring it to me, because I can use it. Maybe you're here today and you don't think that you have a little, but can I tell you, whether your marriage or your relationships are hanging by a thread, you have, and when we bring it to Jesus, he can use it. Maybe you're bound by addiction and you don't think that there's any hope in the little bit that you do have, and you're hanging on by a thread. If you would get boldness and bring it to the foot of Jesus and bring it to Jesus, he's saying, what you have, I can use. What I, what you think that your lack is, I can turn into abundance. So if you think you, if you've got this mindset, come on, come on, that I don't have nothing. My life is broken, it's busted, I'm disgusted, and I can't rap. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> and I can't dunk, but I can be like Christ. I can work, I can walk, and the anointing has been placed on the inside of me. And so what God is trying to communicate is that you have something. The problem is, is you don't realize what you have. And we need to take what we do have and we need to give it to Jesus. Because he's going to do amazing things with it. And he carries on and says, he said, bring them to me. Talking about the fish and the loaves. Then he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. Which is a miracle within itself. I won't even, that's for a different message. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And he looked up to heaven and he blessed and he broke. And he gave the loaves to the disciples. The disciples gave to the multitude. And they all ate and they were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides the women and children. And I think it's funny that in Matthew's account, him being a tax collector, he, he counted every, he, he counted. <laughs> I just believe that day Matthew was going, that guy owes me money. Uh, that guy right there owes me money. But how many of you know at this church that we count everyone? Not just the men. We count the little boys. Too. No, I'm just kidding. We count everyone because, listen, we're all about the numbers at Grace City. I know you've heard probably at churches, oh, they're all just about the, the, the numbers. Well, yeah, we're all about the numbers. We're all about the numbers. We're about the number of lives restored. We're about the number of addicts set free. We're about the number of those that are serving God and loving God. We're all about the numbers. Because every number has a name and every name has a story. I said every number has a name. And every name has a story. So Matthew counts all the people, all the men. So the first step. First step into becoming more like Christ. That's the first thing you have to have compassion. Who do you have a hard time loving? Just think about that. What's your sandpaper person? Who rubs you the wrong way? Who rubs you the wrong way? I mean, I have a hard time loving certain people. I'm just going to be honest. I mean, come on, Seminole fans are really hard to love. Can I get a better amen than that? Bulldog fans. Guys are obnoxious, but you have every right to be, man. <laughs> okay, Gator fans are hard to love. How about <laughs> how about uh, that guy that's in the the fast lane on the interstate? Is that guy not? He's hard to love. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. We got family members that are that are hard to to love. But what if we looked at people that are hard to love through the lens of compassion? What if we started seeing people the way God sees people? See, maybe you're here today and you think compassion is a sign of weakness. But can I tell you that compassion is a sign of strength? That compassion is saying, hey, listen, I know you're not like me and I'm sorry about that because that's cool. But I can love you regardless. See, we don't have to agree on everything. We don't have to think the same things. That we can be different. That, that, that it doesn't matter 
that, that, that you're different than me because I, I, I see you the way God sees you. I'm operating in compassion, and compassion is a sign of strength and not weaknesses because it says no matter what, I can choose. I have the power to choose to love you, to believe that, that I want to see the way that God sees you. And so what did Jesus do instead of teeing off on the crowd through this troubling time and seeing his uh, or hearing about his cousin being beheaded, about John uh, dying? He turns around and he moves with compassion. Can I tell you that compassion was the foundation for the miraculous? I'll say it again, that compassion is the foundation for the miraculous. If you want to start seeing miracles, signs, and wonders, church, start operating on a level of compassion. Start seeing people the way that God starts seeing people. Can, is anybody with me? Man, this country is cold and bitter as a whole. Man, I watched something on Facebook. I think it was on YouTube, man. This little kid, they set this thing up in the streets of New York, and maybe you've seen it. I think this kid, he didn't have a coat and it was cold. And people just walked by him. They walked by him, looking at him, heartless, freezing, shivering. And finally, a bum, somebody that was homeless, came up and gave him a coat. I mean, that's sad. That is ridiculous. And I believe that when we start seeing people the way that God does, we'll automatically respond in compassion and we'll see miracles, signs and wonders. Somebody asked me, Pastor, you still believe in miracles? Absolutely. And he said, why aren't we seeing them in this country? And I said, it's because we don't have any compassion. That we're so consumed with self. That any time you, you feel compassion drawing on your heart, can I tell you that's God wanting to minister to somebody? That's the Holy Ghost wanting to minister to somebody? But so often we ignore that drawing, that compassion that's on the inside of us. And God is trying to, God is trying to get to somebody through compassion. Because last time I checked, God is love. He don't love you because you're lovely. He loves you because that's who he is. And compassion is a sign of love that God is wanting to minister. Come on, church. He's wanting to minister to a lost and dying world but what we got to do is be sensitive enough to the things of God see things the way God sees them and respond the way God would respond that deserves a better amen than that man see God maybe you're here today and you're like man I can't love like God loves maybe that's you can I tell you that you can if you're born again that Romans 5 5 says that the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart that in other words, God has put his love on the inside of you. But there again, if you don't understand what's been placed on the inside of you, how are you ever going to release it? How are you ever going to operate in it? But it's been placed there. I'm a firm believer why in Revelations it talks about every tear uh, he'll wipe up. That there'll be no more crying and sorrow and death. And I thought about that. It's, it's like, why would he be crying in the presence of God? And this is Travisology, and I can't prove it, but I got the talking stick, and so I'm going to use it. <laughs> I think once we realize what it is God has done for us and what he's placed on the inside of us, and we look back on our life and we say, if I'd only known God, if I only would have known what you put on the inside of me, that I had the capacity to love relentlessly, love radically, so I believe that as a church, we need to get a revelation of what God has done for us. That even Jesus in John 15, he said, a new commandment I give to you. A new one. In other words, yeah, love God and love people as, as you would yourself. Uh, no, Jesus said, I got something new for you. He says, I want you to love others as I have loved you. I said, Jesus said and commanded us to love others the way that he did. Because I don't know about you, I hadn't always loved myself the best. I've been pretty harmful to myself. So what Jesus did, he goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to place a new commandment over your life. But guess what? I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send you a helper. You know what the helper's for? One of the purposes? So you can be like Christ. If I could be like Christ, I want to be, I want to be like Christ. Well, he sent a helper to help you so you can operate in this gifting. Man, we need to change the way we see people. Our attitude should be, God, let me see them like you. Second thing, 
because he was concerned. I mean, we're all concerned about things, whether it be our health and money, um, you know, what's happening in politics. Uh, we all have concerns. Will we just agree uh, on that by show of hands? We all have concerns, and, and, it, and it's okay that we have concerns, but what I find in the church is we have concerns um, without compassion. And can I tell you, when you're concerned without compassion, you know what that equals? That equals criticism. That equals criticism. See, if we're just concerned about what somebody's doing, which there's nothing wrong with that, whether it be cocaine, whether it be crack, whether it be drinking too much, and we're just concerned uh, about that instead of having compassion on where they're going and where they're spending eternity, can I tell you that that's not, that, that, that's not compassion, but that's criticism. And I believe that once we set the foundation for, for, uh, for approaching people that are lost from God, when we set a foundation of compassion and love, and then we approach and we're concerned about some things, not just what they're doing, but where they're going. See, Jesus wanted to feed them. He wanted to declare the word of God over their lives. But can I tell you, he was more concerned about where they were heading. And as the church, we need to get a revelation that these people that are dying and going to hell, and you know what, we can fix the other later, but we need to be concerned about that fact. And so when we're just concerned about what people are doing or not doing, we resurrect the the ministry of stop it. You need to stop this, and you need to stop that, and you need to quit that, and you need to quit this. And this is true. But if you hadn't established a relationship, if you're not walking from the foundation of compassion, can I tell you, people don't care what you know until they know that you care, church. And we can look in, 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 in Matthew's account when Jesus walked up to Matthew and said, hey, follow me. And later on through the text in that evening, he wound up going to the house of, of tax collectors and sinners and pimps and prostitutes. And he's sitting down and he's eating with a group of people and he's dialoguing and he's, got a, he's engaged in conversation conversation and and when one of the religious leaders and the Pharisees asked the disciples why does your master why does your teacher eat with sinners and tax collectors and pimps and prostitutes and look and check out what Jesus does don't miss this he stands up and he says oh those that are well don't need no physician they don't need a doctor but those that are sick they need a physician So at that moment, Jesus stands up in the house of Matthew and calls every one of his friends sick. Think about if somebody went up into your house and said, hey, man, you sick. Your friend is sick. You sick. You sick, too. Think about how you would react. You're like, man, I'm going to bust you. You better get. I'll be like Fred G. Sanford. Anybody hearing me? But what Jesus did was he established a relationship with them. He established the fact that, hey, I know that you're you're lost and I know that that you're not doing some things that you should. But let me establish the fact that I love you first. Let me show compassion. Let me share my time with you. Let's engage in dialogue. Let's sit down at the table and talk. And then we can address some concerns, because if there's no compassion connected to your concerns, church, it's criticism. How many of you know, man, the world has enough criticism? See, when our motivation is compassion, then what we are concerned about isn't just about what they're doing, but it's where they're spending eternity. Man, God is concerned. He's concerned first of where they're going. Then he's wanting to clean them up and straighten them up and renew their mind. Man, we need to, be, we need to have compassion that leads us to a place of being concerned. The third thing is compelled. Compelled to be generous. You know, I can, and I can tell you, generosity will mark you like nothing else. If you've had somebody that has just been radically, radically just generous to you, it scars you for life. I mean, the world doesn't understand generosity. I can remember, um, my Aunt Donna, I mean, she is a mighty woman of God. And I hadn't really had a lot of contact with her other than family reunions. And so I wasn't living for the Lord. I mean, I was going crazy at this time. And I had made like 58 payments on a 60-month note just to come up two payments short of uh, paying my truck off. And it got repoed. And how many of you know that I, I was so filled with pride I wasn't going to, you know, 
let somebody know, I was willing to just part with that thing. Say, you know what? I came up short. Two payments, you know, I come up short. But my aunt poked and prodded and, and asked the right questions, and she was kind of relentless because she probably knew the Holy Spirit was <laughs> encouraging her to say, hey, ask this, do this. And finally, I just said, I, I just got honest with her. I said, no, I said, my truck got repoed. She's like, oh, really? I said, yeah. I said, I only have two payments left on it. And it's paid off. And she goes, uh-uh. <laughs> All right, that ain't happening. How much you owe on that thing? And I've been paying on it for five plus years. And she did whatever it took. She made whatever arrangements with the bank. And she paid that truck off. But can I tell you that that was years ago. And that event marked me to the degree that her and I have a relationship. I mean, it's at least once every two weeks that I'm talking to her. And it messed me up, y'all, because generosity will mark the world. And the world doesn't understand generosity. It's foreign. It doesn't make sense. And, you know, as I was preparing for this message and doing some research, I researched the days that waiters and waitresses receive the best tips. Can I tell you what day it's not? It's not Sunday. It's on Friday and Saturday night when Billy, Bob, and Sally are wasted and they're generous. And I believe that's the church as we stand up and we're moved by compassion and we're concerned about some things and we're compelled to be generous that we can mark a generation for the kingdom of God, that we can radically change communities. So it's a sad, sad day on Sunday afternoon for waitresses because and waiters because that is the worst day for tips. Golly. I seen that and I wanted to sling my laptop right through the double window. I did. <clears throat> These things ought not to be. Sunday. Man, we should be coming out of these doors and blessing people radically because we've been blessed to be a blessing. Do you know what? I mean, and I would encourage you uh, today, if you go out to eat, bless your waiter, bless your waitress, leave a just a humongous tip, and they'll be talking about it the rest of the week when you do something and you step up for the kingdom of God and for Jesus and do something radical. It marks a generation, and they're compelled to it, and they're drawn to it because they don't understand it because generosity will jack you up man and I got to see the compassion and the love of God through somebody's giving through a selfless act man and it it radically radically changed me and maybe you're here today and you're like where do you get that out of the text you know where is generosity generosity the boy the boy had five loaves and two fish he had that but actually, it belonged to Jesus. It belonged to Jesus. Listen to Romans eleven thirty six. 36. For of him and through him and to him, all things are made. That are all belong to him. To whom be the glory forever. Amen. In other words, church, when your attitude and your mindset shifts from ownership to stewardship, can I tell you, you get generous, you start responding to what God has called you to do, that when you get, when you get a revelation that he owns all the cattle on the field, I said he owns it all. The reason you can't take nothing with you is because it don't belong to you. It belongs to a king, a good one. It belongs to God. And he's put you as a steward over the things that he owns. And when you get a mindset that this isn't mine, this is not ownership, but it's stewardship. And I'll give an account of what God has entrusted me to, to, to do with what belongs to him. Can I tell you? You'll start being generous. And see, the boy was just giving back to God what already belonged to God. Watch this. I don't want you to miss this. He was just responding to what God had called him to do. And he gave what already belonged to God. He gave it back to him. And can I tell you what God gave back through that was a lot more. Was a lot more than five loaves and two fish. We can all count here, right? Twelve basketfuls. I said twelve basketfuls. And see when he got an understanding and when we get a revelation of of I'm just a steward to what God has provided. And my generosity compels me 
to give it back to Jesus. Can I tell you, he always gives you back more. He's the God that does exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can ask, more than we can think. But yet I find so often we take ownership of that thing and we're like grace. And, and, and my daughter, not like the concept, but we're like grace and that's mine. And we hold on to it so tight because we don't have a revelation that it doesn't belong to me. I'm just the steward to what God has given me. And when we start doing that, man, we start walking into a level of maturity and God starts using us. Man, we start, can, is anybody with me? And so as the church, my heart's cry is, man, get a revelation that you're a steward, not an owner. And I can tell you, you'll bless, bless, bless God's people. Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. You can help me lay in this thing. The third thing, or fourth thing, I'm sorry, is the church. It's the church. You're like, Pastor, where's the church in the feeding of, of the 5,000? Oh, man. Well, last time I checked, what a group of people that were gathered together. Don't miss this that are gathered around God's word and countering, countering the person of Jesus. Serving one another, disciples serving the people, people getting fed spiritually, needs getting met physically. Man, that's church. Sitting down, sitting down. He made them all sit down. Resting and trusting and relaxing in what God was going to provide for them. Can I tell you, there's too many Christians that are trying to stand up and get fed in church. But God is declaring in this moment, you need to sit down and you need to rest in what I'm doing in your life. Oh, hallelujah. People gathered around getting fed. Mm. Loving on one another. Giving sacrificially. Man, what would it look like, church? What would it look like if we were a church that was full of compassion and we were concerned and compelled to be generous and met together and celebrated the person of Jesus, that we, we served our fellow man, that we served in our church, that we loved one another? What would that look like? What would it look like to be like Christ? See, Mike, Michael Jordan, when he put this in his hand, it was amazing. It was amazing. But how many of you know Michael starred in a movie called Space Jam? And he set the ball down. It was average. It was average. Nobody's going, man, that guy's going to win an Academy Award for his acting. No. this in his hand it was amazing but when he set it down and he tried to play baseball it was average average and as Christians as, I hope you get a revelation of this as Christians when you're plugged into the local church, it's just like when Mike has a ball in his hands. It is phenomenal. It is awesome. It's what he was created to do. It was his gifting and his calling. But when you take the Christian out of the church, it's like Michael setting the ball away and walking away and trying to do something that God never created him to do. And he became very, very average. And if you're here today and you think that you don't need church to be saved, you're right. But you'll be very, very, very very average and God ain't called us to be average he's called us to walk in the anointing and in the gifting and in the calling the power and the authority to make a difference on the earth I'm challenging you church put the ball in your hand do what God has created you to do Mike didn't need to play 
basketball. Very happy. Very happy for away from what God has called me to do. Compassion. Stand with me, church. Compassion plus concern plus compelled to be generous plus the church equals say it with me church be like Christ if I could be like Christ you can you can if you're here today with every head bowed every eye closed you know what you're like pastor I've never made Jesus my Lord and Savior. That I'm the furthest thing from Christ and I don't have a lot to offer. I don't even know that He could use what I have. Can I tell you friend in this moment, He can use that. He can use that. I said He could use that. And if that's you with every head bowed, every eye closed for privacy and you haven't made this decision, today is the day of salvation. On the count of three, I want to pray with you. One, two, three. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Father, I thank you for the hands that were raised. I thank you, Lord, for the hearts of your people. I thank you, God, what you're doing in this moment, Lord. I thank you, God, that it's by your spirit. And Lord, I thank you that when we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, Lord, that you are faithful to save us, God. That you're a good God. Lord, and I just celebrate with all of heaven in this holy moment for those that raised their hands, for those hearts that were changed and transformed. God, we give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said... Man, now, I ain't done with you. I know you guys are getting hungry. But I know it. But you're getting hungry to bless your waiter or waitress. You're getting hungry to be compassionate. You're getting hungry to be concerned and compelled to be generous. <laughs> if you're here today and you're a believer and you're like, man, these are some areas in my life that I have neglected, that I've gotten away from that I need help in, that I can take a step in these areas of my life. I just want to pray with you real quick, real quick. If that's you on the count of three, just slip your hand up and pull it back down. I just want to pray with you. One, two, three. I see your hands. I'm raising mine. I'm raising mine. I'm with you, church. There's some areas of my life that I could be better, that I can be more like Christ, that, that, that this is a journey, that we're not all, that we haven't arrived yet, but by, praise God we've left, amen, that, that the Lord, we can look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. God, we thank you for that. Well, Father, I thank you, Lord. Let us be a church that's compassionate. Let us uh, be a church that loves people radically, Lord. Let us be concerned and, and not be uh, critical of people. Lord, let us be concerned about the eternal destination and not exactly what they're doing, knowing in that good season and in due time, God, that you'll clean them up. You'll, you'll shape them. You'll form them. God, that you're the potter and we're the clay. Lord, that you've instructed us to do some things. Lord, let us be compelled to be generous, God. Let us mark this community. Let us mark people in Lake City with our generosity, Lord. Lord, if they could see you, God, let our hearts cry be, I must decrease, God, and you must increase Lord, let us come together as the church, Lord. Let us walk in an anointing and power and authority. Let us our eyes be open to what it is you provided for us. Let us be the church and the people that you've called us to be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen, man. Give it up for Jesus. He's so good this morning. He's so good.